This is MPB News. Hi, this is Karen Brown. Thanks for checking out the Mississippi Edition podcast. If you like what you hear, click subscribe, hit like, or leave us a comment if your app has that feature. Then find other MPB podcasts by searching MPB Think Radio on your favorite podcasting platform. Thanks. Good morning. It's 8.30 on Friday, August 7th. I'm Karen Brown, and this is Mississippi Edition on MPB Think Radio. On today's show, one year after the immigration raids that shook Mississippi communities, the U.S. Attorney's Office issues indictments against processing plant management. Then, a Mississippi judge's opinion on qualified immunity scrutinizes the practice that has shielded law enforcement officers. Plus, member institutions of the NCAA's Division III won't be playing sports this fall. We talk to the AD of one of Mississippi's D3 schools. This is Mississippi Edition on MPB Think Radio. One year ago today, agents from U.S. Immigration and Customs Enforcement raided seven central Mississippi chicken processing plants, detaining over 600 undocumented workers. It was the largest single state raid in American history. Now the U.S. Attorney's Office is holding management of those plants accountable through indictments against four plant executives. MPB's Desiree Frazier talks with U.S. Attorney Mike Hurst. We're announcing the unsealing of indictments against four individuals, um, managers, supervisors, and HR personnel connected with two of the companies where we executed search warrants last year. Um, One individual has been charged with um, assisting illegal aliens in uh, obtaining false Social Security numbers, making false statements to officials, and uh, assisting aliens to represent themselves as U.S. citizens. And another um, individual at the same company, A&B Incorporated in Pelahatchie, has been charged with um, making false uh, uh, employer reports uh, representing falsely Social Security uh, numbers for particular uh, illegal aliens and and, um, fraudulently misrepresenting other things such as uh, Social Security numbers used by those aliens uh, for employment. So there's a number of uh, uh, charges related to those two individuals at A&B, and then we have uh, charges against individuals at Pearl River Foods in Carthage, Mississippi. What kind of charges would they potentially face if found guilty? The I mean, two in- penalties, rather. Penalties, yeah. The 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 one individual at A and B um, Incorporated in Pelahatchie, who was a supervisor, he is facing up to seventy four years in federal prison and up to two point five million dollars in fines. The other individual um, uh, at A and B Incorporated, uh, Iris Villalon, is facing up to twenty years in prison and up to seven hundred and fifty thousand dollars in fines. The two individuals at Pearl River Foods, Carolyn Johnson, uh, an HR manager, is facing up to 84 years in prison and $2.25 million in fines. And Aubrey Bart Willis, who is a manager at Pearl River Foods, is looking at up to 50 years in prison and $1.25 million in fines. Can you talk about the length of time it took to do this investigation and any elements that you can share in that regard? Well, I I can tell you that uh, Homeland Security Investigations did an incredible job investigating this case. They have been investigating these individuals for a number of years. Um, And frankly, with the experience that our office has in prosecuting managers, supervisors, owners, and companies, um, these are not cases that um, uh, are done really quickly. I mean, these are very complex, very um, time-intensive, and um, really complicated cases. So the fact that our investigators and our prosecutors were able to bring indictments on managers, supervisors, and HR personnel within one year is pretty incredible. Would you be able to say, or is there an inkling that this is a widespread problem? 
Yeah, I don't want to get into saying whether it's a widespread problem or not. Um, all I can say is that if you look at the history of our office, if you look at the number of owners just this week, just Tuesday, an owner uh, of a company and his company in Madison pled guilty to harboring illegal aliens. Um, last October, a construction company owner uh, was sentenced for harboring illegal aliens. So this office has a long, successful history of prosecuting owners, managers, companies for violating our immigration laws. And the indictments today uh, continue that long history of doing that. When workers are desperately needed for uh, some companies, why pursue these cases? Well, I think after we executed those criminal search warrants and administrative search warrants last year, um, the uh, photographs and the news stories showing that hundreds of Mississippians and American citizens lining up for these jobs uh, proves that Americans will do these jobs. I mean, the simple fact of the matter is illegal aliens take jobs that American citizens should be doing. And despite what the critics will tell you, complaining that Americans won't do these jobs, I think the photographs and the evidence show differently. The simple fact of the matter is that illegal aliens um, depress wages that are paid to American citizens. And if those uh, lawbreakers are taken away from those jobs, Americans and Mississippians will step up and do them. And you're talking about the August raids? That's correct. That was last year? Is there anything that I didn't ask you that's important about this to point out? Yeah, I would I would ask the um, I would ask people to focus on the victims of illegal immigration here. Um, we arrest, excuse me, immigration detained 680 illegal immigrants. But what the media is not reporting is that 400 American citizens identities were stolen. So we have 400 victims who are Americans who were taken advantage of by these 680 using their identities. And I will also ask that, um, you know, there, there are national security implications here with enforcing our immigration laws. There are issues with fairness of uh, immigrants who come to this country the legal way, who follow our laws, who become naturalized citizens. It's not really fair for those who jump the border skip the lines, don't pay uh, the, uh, the application fees, and don't follow the process. It's not fair to our new naturalized citizens who make our country great um, if we don't enforce our immigration laws. Well, U.S. Attorney Mike Hurst, we really appreciate your time in speaking with us. Thank you. Thank you, Desiree. Next, a Mississippi judge's opinion on qualified immunity scrutinizes a practice that has shielded law enforcement officers. This is Mississippi Edition on MPB Think Radio. Hi, I'm Walt Grayson. Join me on Mile Marker, a Mississippi Roads podcast about the wild, weird, and wonderful stories of Mississippi. You can listen by going to mpbonline.org slash radio or by using your favorite podcasting app. And of course, all of MPB's other great podcasts are there, too. Join me as we hit the roads of Mississippi on Mile Marker. Coming August 1st to your favorite podcasting app. I'm Karen Brown. Clarence Jameson wasn't jaywalking. He wasn't outside playing with a toy gun. He didn't look like a suspicious person. He wasn't suspected of selling loose, untaxed cigarettes. He wasn't suspected of passing a counterfeit $20 bill. Those are the first five lines of U.S. District Judge Carlton Reeves' opinion upholding a claim of qualified immunity for Officer Nick McClendon. In 2013, McClendon pulled over Clarence Jameson in Pulahatchee, detaining him for two hours searching for suspected drugs that were never found. In the opening pages, Reeves gives 19 different examples of what Jameson, a black man, wasn't doing when he was pulled over by McClendon, each example invoking the memory of other black men and women whose lives were ended through excessive police force. Reeves further opined the qualified immunity doctrine operates like absolute immunity in real life. But based on legal precedent, Reeves was compelled to uphold the doctrine. Jarvis Dorch is the executive director of the Mississippi chapter of the ACLU. He shares his thoughts on Reeves' opinion with our Kobe Vance. You know, it's I understood why he um, up, upheld that um, and applied qualified immunity. Uh, he followed the law as a district court judge is supposed to do. Um, 
but I was really appreciative of how he framed it and talked about um, how qualified immunity has become such a clutch or such a, a barrier to actually allowing people to seek justice when they're harmed by police or government officials. Um, and, and the fact that he went through all of the uh, black men and women that have been harmed just from interactions with police officers and, you know, qualified immunity has to be a part of that when people know that no matter how they do their job, they, they can't be held accountable, um, at least uh, in, in a civil court. And now qualified immunity is, has been talked about nationally for a few weeks now. And for just for the people who may not uh, exactly have a, gr- a firm understanding of what it is, could you go over what qualified immunity is and how it's disproportionately impacted the African-American community? Yeah, so qualified immunity is a legal standard that was established about 40 years ago, and it allows any government, government official that can violate someone's rights, even intentionally, um, and they can't be held accountable unless a court in the actual jurisdiction that action took place in has ruled that that exact um, that exact action is clearly established to be unconstitutional, which means you have to have a fact pattern that is the same as what you're alleging happened to you. And a court had to already say that this is clearly unconstitutional and how that plays out. I mean, there's a case in Texas where a prison guard pepper sprayed a, an inmate for no reason, just pepper sprayed them and qualified immunity applied because there was no fact pattern on a case that matched that one that had been clearly established to be unconstitutional. So even though he intentionally violated that person's rights, um, and knew what he was doing wrong, he's not liable or accountable. And now some people say qualified immunity protects officers from frivolous lawsuits. Do you think it still serves that purpose today? Yeah, I mean, if, if the intent was to make sure that police officers and other government officials were um, not burdened with you know frivolous lawsuits, I think that's been addressed by a lot of the changes in the pleading standards in um, federal courts right now. It's very difficult to bring a frivolous lawsuit and get it past the, you know, summary judgment phase because we have made it very difficult to um, to bring those suits because we have to show so much evidence on the front end that there's a credible claim. Um, As well as we've, you know, the the intent was also to probably help um, government officials to not be held accountable for, you know, split second decisions. You know, in this case, right here that Judge Rees was dealing with, they held someone on the side of a road for two hours and searched them. So that's not a split second decision. That was an intentional act to basically deprive someone of their, their constitutional rights. Jarvis Dorch is the executive director of the Mississippi chapter of the ACLU. Advocates for the doctrine within the police ranks say qualified immunity isn't designed to protect bad cops. Byron Police Chief Luke Thompson is president of the Mississippi Association of Chiefs of Police. There's a difference between a bad cop and a good cop that makes a that makes a mistake. And that's that's the key here. The qualified immunity is for an officer, a good officer that might make a mistake or that might not make the best decision. There's always more than one way to solve a problem, right? So so the qualified immunity is for that officer. Unfortunately, there have been bad ones that have come through the system and have been able to take advantage of, of that. But we see in, in any system, there's always someone that takes advantage of something and finds some way to exploit the system. So, you know, and then, and then you look at different parts of the country. You know, in the South, we're – uh, our system, our policing system is a lot different in the South because we don't necessarily have things like police unions and collective bargaining agreements. So we don't have things in place that that serve to protect um, some not so great cops um, from sometimes from not so great police administrators. Uh, and uh, along the South, we don't really have a lot of that. Um, and, and I'm afraid that we might be losing sight of what it's what it's really for, and the fact that 99.9%, 99.99% of those of those officers are good officers out there working their tails off, providing for their families, protecting their communities, and they've got to be allowed 
to 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 not be perfect because nobody is right. That's what qualified immunity is for. We have seen just another uh, long summer of uh, cries for cries for justice for a lot of uh, African Americans, um, and there's been uh, another cry for removing um, qualified immunity completely. Um, what do you think? W- do you think that's a bad idea to remove qualified immunity completely instead of just uh, trying to change it or fix it? I will, well, see, I don't necessarily believe that qualified immunity is broke. So as, as far as, again, as far as it's changing, it will evolve as our system evolves. Qualified immunity is established in case law. It's not a legislative thing, um, and it's established by the Supreme Court. The Supreme Court will have to make certain decisions that will override some of those protections in qualified immunity. Um, the cross, you know, I, 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 and I don't believe in protecting bad cops. Okay, I, I'm, look, I, I have put handcuff, I have put handcuffs on cops. I've arrested cops, and 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 that's a tough thing to do. That's not easy. It's not easy to do the right thing all the time. Um, but that's where that's where we need need to be, and then we need to allow our systems to to take place. So we, we've got to make sure that that we afford even bad cops have to be afforded the rights. Because when we play this right, when we when we use the system again, using Judge Reed's own words, it, it, when when we use the system, we protect good people from bad cops, and we put bad cops in prison as, as exactly where they should be. But we also make sure that we protect good cops that simply made the not so greatest decision. Lou Thompson is the police chief of Byram and president of the Mississippi Association of Chiefs of Police. Reeves closes his opinion saying he does not envy the Supreme Court. He says, in part, overturning qualified immunity will undoubtedly impact our society. Yet the status quo is extraordinary and unsustainable. Just as the Supreme Court swept away the mistaken doctrine of separate but equal, so too should it eliminate the doctrine of qualified immunity. This is Mississippi Edition on MPB Think Radio. Hey, this is Malcolm White. I'm one of the hosts of the Mississippi Arts Hour, the arts interview show on Think Radio. Every week we talk with visual artists, musicians, as well as people who help bring the arts to their communities. We hear about how each artist learned their craft and get some insight into their creative process. You can hear the Arts Hour every Sunday at 5 p.m. or listen anytime by subscribing to the show through your favorite podcast app. This is Mississippi Edition on MPB Think Radio. I'm Karen Brown. College sports in the NCAA's two lower levels won't take place this fall. On Wednesday, the President's Councils for the Governing Bodies Division 2 II and 3 announced they would cancel fall championships for the 2021 seasons. This decision means Mississippi's member schools, like Mississippi College, Delta State, and Bellhaven, will have to reimagine what their sports calendars will look like as they adjust plans to potentially play fall sports in the spring. Aaron Pelch is the athletic director of Millsaps College, a NCAA D3 school. He says schools are awaiting guidance from the NCAA regarding what possibilities exist for fall sports. He shares his plans and reaction to the decision with us. We feel like there's a model out there and we're working on that right now within the conference and then with our women coaches. We think that there's a model out there that will allow us uh, to be able to play. It's not going to be easy from an administrative standpoint, it's not going to be easy from a training room standpoint. It's not going to be easy on our athletes to a certain extent either uh, that are used to doing things maybe in a different way. But, you know, we are really concerned about making sure that we make this experience for athletes just as good and as normal as it can possibly be with the understanding that nothing is normal right now. So we are just really committed to doing the best that we can for them and, and give them the most opportunities to be able to compete. Football would be the most contact, <laughs> the most physically compa- uh, contact sport, as opposed to soccer and certainly cross country. The concern, though, it seems with all of the sports is transportation, getting you from one location to another. Right. Have you even looked at that yet, or is it too soon? No, we've looked at that. That was one of the reasons why, as a conference, I think we decided to to. Uh, to make the decision to, to move the fall sports to the spring river because 
figuring travel out was very, very difficult in addition to the increased cost because National Transportation Safety Board has new regulations on capacity in buses and companies have safety concerns for their drivers and, and things like that. So there's going to be an increased cost. The logistics, if you get a sick athlete and you're on an overnight trip, and being able to get that person back safely and, you know, there's, there's so many things with travel that were so difficult to figure out. The NCAA had already canceled Division Two games, and then just yesterday, Division Three. They have not canceled Division One, which is the big money football. I mean, hundreds right. of millions of dollars is tied, right. maybe billions of dollars tied up in college football Division One. How do you right. feel about that? Do you think it's completely financially motivated? You know, I, I really think that it's it's multifaceted. I really do. I think that there is definitely a financial motivation for sure uh, behind it uh, because they do rely on the dollars that football brings in to support, uh, in some cases, entire athletic departments. But the other part about it is I believe that they are looking at it from the, from the perspective that they have the financial backing in order to be able to do this in the safest way possible. And they're able to do things financially that a school like ours or a school like Mississippi College or, you know, somebody else wouldn't be able to do with the testing protocols and transportation differences. You know, if they wanted to, they could fly in in a private plane day of every game, never have to spend the night anywhere if they chose to do that. A lot of institutions, not all of them, but a lot of them could make that choice. So they have different constraints on this. So I think that they're looking at it, and I know that they're looking at it from the health and safety standpoint for sure. I'm in, t- I'm in regular touch with our former athletic director here at Millsaps, who is the athletic director of Georgia. And they're going through a lot of the same, you know, things that we went through here. They just have more resources to be able to solve those problems. You're certainly small by comparison, but this has to have a financial impact on Millsaps as well in sponsorships and ticket sales and as you said, the ancillary businesses that benefit. Right. So we're not as impacted by those things. You know, we're the only the only gate that we take is on football. So there's a minimal loss right there, concession revenue a little bit. But again, because we're such a small operation, we don't have as many fans, it's not as broad. Now, uh, you know, other places like Mississippi College may rely a little bit more on sponsorship dollars and those kind of things and, 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 and we don't have a ton of that this point in time so it's less impactful from a financial standpoint for us than it is for some institutions that are like us but also our kids are are here for a variety of reasons you know and most of our kids aren't looking to move on and and play professional level you know in in whatever sports they play they're looking to come get a great education and then move on into their careers so our you know it's impactful for sure and it's sad because these kids are prepared as hard as they have with their time, but it's impactful maybe not, not as much financially and, and definitely in a different way for the athletes. President Rob Perigen posted uh, a letter on Millsap's website talking about the fall semester, the challenges, and was very candid about how difficult financially and how much this would impact the college if they couldn't be on campus that that's, sort, that's the bread and butter and it would affect uh, the future of the college. Do you have any right. response to that, particularly in regard to athletics? Well, I just I think that the type of education that we provide, which is this small liberal arts community-based learning, is really difficult to deliver in an online atmosphere. You can do it, but it takes a lot of extra effort to be able to do that. And so I think that our concern on athletics is the same exact way. How do we get better as athletes? How do we get better as football players, as volleyball players, as soccer players, when we're going to be so restricted and so limited? So, yeah, there's there's some definite concerns. What I'll say about coaches in general, and and our coaches for sure, is that coaches are extremely creative. And if anybody can figure out how to get to a student athlete and how to train in a creative way and within limitations and things like that, it's going to be a coach. So... I think, you know, from the athletic side, I think we'll come out okay. Aaron Pelch is the athletic director at Millsaps College. I hope you have football games in January and February, Coach. (laughs) Hey, so do I. So do I. Thank you so much. Thanks. 
This has been Mississippi Edition on MPB Think Radio. Thanks for listening to the Mississippi Edition podcast from MPB News and MPB Think Radio. Don't forget to subscribe if you haven't already. And if your app lets you, leave a comment or review. We really do appreciate it. Remember, you can always get in touch with MPB News on Facebook and Twitter. And fresh episodes of the podcast are posted every weekday morning. I'm Karen Brown. Thanks for listening.